Uh, well, th this project came out of a book chapter that I wrote for the Oxford Handbook on the Creative Process in Music. And that book looked as a whole on the different ways that creative people, musicians, composers, performers, improvisers, um, do what they do, how they create new things. It's a challenge to get out of that. And I think for a long time, it's been very mysterious how exactly people manage to be creative. What does it mean to be creative? And this corner of that story is all about how we choose constraints, we choose limitations, and paradoxically, the constraints actually help us. It's really kind of counterintuitive that having constraints can make us more original, more creative, they can help us search outside our comfort zone for new things. And in general, they really help to um, encourage innovation and also perhaps to keep that innovation on a steady footing, to give it a solid language, a consistency, and a means of expression. For, for centuries, people got most of their constraints from the environment they worked in. So a composer could say, I'm gonna be writing this sonata in E minor for violin and piano, and already that would tell them an enormous number of things about how to start, what chords to choose, what form to use, what kinds of melodies, what kinds of relationships between the instruments. So that was how we worked for centuries, for a really long time. Uh, Stravinsky talks about this, how after, say, 1910, when tonality starts to crumble, we actually have very few rules and everything seems possible. And he points out that this is liberating, but it's also totally terrifying. You can do whatever you want, but if you can do whatever you want, what do you do first? And his idea was that you needed to put some rules on that, put some constraints that you could choose an element, choose a way to get started, choose some ways to proceed, and then you could continue, then you could start writing. But it is almost paralyzing to have so many choices. I think it's related to discipline. Um, it's not rules for rules sake, I suppose, but it is perhaps steering your brain in different ways, steering your mind in different ways. Uh, some composers do really approach it like a practice. They want to be working within a very strict environment. They want to be able to solve problems that they set for themselves, and they want those problems to be demanding and challenging. For some people, that demandingness, the fact that it's a difficult problem, actually makes them work at their best. They work really well when it's really hard. I think many of us find that we're at our peak efficiency, our, um, maybe our most powerful thinking, when it's really difficult, when we're tackling a tough problem. Um, it's not always discipline in a strict way, though, and sometimes composers will abandon rules they set out. Sometimes the rules are there just to get started, um, but it does at least help to steer us in certain directions. Sometimes it's about steering more than discipline, if that makes sense. I don't think the music is mystified. I think there are a lot of misconceptions about it, which I'm hoping to counter a bit. Um, I teach contemporary music a lot at both my home university, McGill, and at a Paris summer course that I teach. And lots of people assume that contemporary music is very esoteric, that it's all about numbers or riddles or puzzles of some kind, and they have this idea that it's something that no one could possibly understand or enjoy. And that's what I really want to get at, is the sense that it's something absolutely esoteric, absolutely abstract. And what I'm hoping to do is to talk about ways in which it is really expressive. I think we're actually in a great age for contemporary music right now. Ways in which most of the structures are actually much more accessible than we think. And in fact, that we can trust our aesthetic instincts. If we come to it with an open-minded approach, we will really be rewarded by what's there. So the music's fine. I think our myths about it are what, what are the problems. I think the most difficult thing is that since the 1970s especially, we see music really being about sounds and not so much about notes and rhythms. So when you have music which is about sounds, it's liberating because you have the whole world of sound available. But it's also very difficult for musicologists because it's hard to quantify. And when everything was a note on a page and defined by a note on a page, you could say that's a pitch, that's a rhythm, a duration. It was easy to work with those. They're like whole numbers you can juggle around. Whereas something like a timbre or an electroacoustic sound or a multiphonic on a clarinet, they're very hard objects to deal with in any systematic way. So to me, that's the big revolution of the past 40 years. Even though it started before then with people like Pierre Schaeffer and Penderecki, sonorism, I think since 1970 or 75, that aspect has really grown, that music has the whole range of sounds, that we're dealing with timbre more often with notes, 
and musicology isn't quite there yet. I'm not there yet either, but we're trying to catch up to find ways to explain that richness and how music could work if it's not just about pitch and rhythm.